Nehemiah chapter number 1. We begin reading verse number 1, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. And it came to pass in the month of Chislu, the twelfth year, as I was in Shushan, the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the providence are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. It came to pass when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept, and mourned certain days, and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Let's pray. Father, we sure do bless you. We enjoyed the good singing. Lord, we're thankful when the doctor said that Mikey would never amount to anything, that you had other plans. God, we're certainly glad you're still able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. The God that you're not limited unless we put limitations on you in our own hearts. And so, Father, I pray that, Lord, for the next few minutes, you'd put a hedge about us and you'd speak to our hearts. And Lord, I know I'm mainly preaching to the Emmanuel Baptist Church tonight, but I learned a long time ago, if you come seeking God, you'll find some help in the message. And so, God, I pray you'll help your people. I certainly pray, as Brother Phil prayed, if there's anybody lost amongst us tonight, Lord, I know the Holy Ghost can do anything he wants to do, and I pray that, Lord, you'd convict that lost person. And God, I pray under that conviction they'd come and repent and trust Christ as Lord and Savior. I do pray for a sustained revival. Lord, I've been longing for one for many, many years. Lord, I sure would love to see one. And God, I pray that, Lord, may it start somewhere and fan our way, or if it be pleasing to you, start it here. And God, fan it abroad that many would come to Christ, that your churches would be refreshed and alive and well during these days. Now, Lord, use this unworthy vessel. Lord, help me to be all I can be for thee. I certainly pray for little Ella Rose. I pray for those that are traveling. I pray for... Uncle Ed's having heart surgery tomorrow. I pray for others that have great need, God, that you'd move upon them. Now, Father, help us this night. We'll bless you for it, for it's in the wonderful and holy name of the Lord Jesus. We do pray. Amen. Amen. I want to draw your attention to a couple of things as a way of introduction. First of all, I want you to notice the request. In verse number two, Nehemiah ask of Hanai and the men of Judah he asked about the Jews that had escaped uh, which were left of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem he had some questions he wanted to know what was going on Uh, I learned a long time ago if you don't want to know what's going on don't ask Uh, but if you ask you better be ready for the news that you might receive Uh, Here he was concerned. He's serving in the palace Shushan. uh, And God had showed him favor while they were in captivity there. uh, But his heart was still on his homeland. uh, And his heart was concerning other people. uh, So he makes a request. He asks uh, what was going on. Now notice the report in verse number 3. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there uh, in the providence are in great affliction. uh, and reproach and the wall of Jerusalem also is broken down and the gates there are uh, thereof uh, are burned with fire uh, he finds out uh, those of his homeland uh, those in uh, uh, of his brethren uh, uh, even his homeland itself he finds there's great suffering uh, they're in great reproach that means they're in shame uh, 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 that means they're being mocked and in derision uh, they have no self esteem uh, and the city itself uh, has been left in shambles. Uh, He leaves in Jerusalem, uh, is beautiful, uh, but now because of war, uh, and now because 
Israel had lived wickedly in the sight of God and not repented. Uh, all he had ever known has been torn apart. Uh, and can I say if uh, uh, churches like ours don't have revival, all that we've known in America is not going to resemble the America we grew up with. Uh, it don't today. Hmm? We're headed for destruction, my dear friends. Listen, if God didn't let Rome get away with it, and if God didn't let Sodom get away with it, and God didn't let Nineveh get away with it, uh, and God didn't let Pompeii get away with it, uh, and God didn't let other countries get away with it, you think he's going to let America get away with it? Uh, the Bible says where much is given, much is required. Can I say God requires more of America than he ever did Sodom? America's had the Bible. America's had the gospel. America's had the truth. Uh, and America's headed for destruction. You say, well, preacher, that is woe is me. That's just the truth, friend. He gets a report and that breaks his heart. Notice his reaction in verse number four. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Notice he didn't have to see it himself. Notice he just heard the report. Can I say there are a lot of people say, well, unless I see it with my own eyes, I won't believe it. Uh, can I say truth is truth? And he heard it from witnesses. Hmm? Listen, I've never been to Israel. I've never seen Mount Calvary. I certainly didn't see it when Jesus hung there and bled and died. Huh? But I've heard the witnesses who did from the word of God. Uh, and can I say, uh, 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 people that met Jesus uh, 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 come and told me about him. Uh, and all I had to do was hear what they had to say and realize what Jesus offered was a whole lot better than what I had. Huh? He heard and it impacted his life. Here we go. Building the next step. I find everything that we're going to need to do to get prepared to have that building out front. Can I say, upon finding out the need, Nehemiah, first thing he did, he halted from everything and took some time. Look what it said. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I picked up a shovel and I started digging. He sat down. He had to take in what he'd heard. He took some time and he began to uh, 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 listen to what they had to say and he began to meditate on it and think about it. Uh, uh, the Bible has a lot to say about building. Uh, and one of the things the Bible says uh, is don't start building a tower unless you've considered the cost. Uh, unless you start and you're not able to finish it uh, and you become a, a mockery to everybody around you. Uh, uh, listen, uh, we don't want to be a mockery. Uh, we don't want to start laying a foundation out there and aren't able to finish it. Uh, uh, the first thing we need to do, uh, we need to take some time, uh, get a hold of God uh, and get God's uh, approval on everything before we ever start. Uh, mm, it's a dangerous thing to jump out on blind faith when it comes to something this big. Now, Brother Ray was sitting... Where you at, Brother Ray? Brother Ray was sitting with me when we met with the first architect who will not be the architect we will use. I mean, when the guy comes back, I told him what we wanted, didn't I? And he comes back with elevators, all kinds of wet bars in Sunday school rooms and all kinds of... Uh, I mean, uh, you know, lifestyles of rich and famous church. We're not interested in all that. But Brother Ray was sitting there when he told us it was going to cost us two and a half million dollars. You should have seen that guy's jaw hit the table when I started marking up, nope, we don't need this, nope, we don't need this, nope, we don't need this. I was cutting hundreds of thousands of dollars right now. But you should have seen him when I said, well, we, we, we can get by for at least a million and a half. Now, I don't know about you, but that's more money than I've ever seen in my lifetime. Well, you're talking a million and a half dollars. Today's economy. We built this one for half a million. A million and a half dollars? I don't know about you, but we better stop and think about this. That's a whole lot of pecans. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. hmm? Uh, uh, I bet you they built that old one for probably about 75000 A uh, hundred tops. We're talking a million and a half minimum. Somebody ought to 
take some time to think about this thing. Amen. It's what I've been doing. And the Lord knows God gives me a nudge. I'm ready to go. But a million and a half dollars, I, I, I have a hard time looking at Brother Ed and say, Brother Ed, empty out your pocketbook. I know you got it. <laughs> Are you not a king and priest in Christ? Do you not own it all? Well, just he, he gives his, you know, he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Just ask him for a few of it, huh? <laughs> Where's it going to come from, Brother Doug? God. Yeah. But I'm not going to jump out there and say, okay, God, we're in the middle of this thing when you're coming through. Do you know how many churches I've seen falter? Do you know how many preachers I've seen said, Ah, God called me to evangelism, uh, never to get a meeting. Uh, how do you know how many people I've seen jump out on nothing, thinking, Boy, God's going to take care of me. But if God's not in it, God's not required to take care of you. So the first thing he does is he halts from everything and he takes some time. He sat down. But then notice... I'm talking about what it's going to take to have a building tonight. Not only did he do that, notice he wept. The Bible says that I sat down and wept. That didn't mean he shed a tear. That mean he was broken hearted and he sobbed until his soul hurt. Uh, uh, can I say, uh, 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 why in the world do we need a building if we're not willing to weep over some things? Uh, listen, uh, you know when we'll get a building, Miss Marcy, uh, is when you start weeping uh, over your children that aren't in church and your grandchildren and your family members, uh, some that need to be saved, some that are out of church. Uh, and Miss Mary, you get to weeping over your family uh, and you get to weeping and miss into over your family uh, and you get to crying and weeping uh, then all of a sudden you start weeping over my family uh, and you start weeping over Mary's family uh, you start weeping over Miss Cinda's family uh, and we all start weeping over one another's family uh, and then all of a sudden uh, we get to weeping over sinners uh, uh, folks in this community that's never heard the gospel uh, folks that are lost without God uh, hey uh, without tears we don't need a building Hmm. I dare say it's been a long time since any of you have even wept over your own family members. Amen. I'm telling you, if we're going to get a building, it'll be built on tears. Hmm. Now, I've already read the book of Nehemiah several times and studied it. It's a great manual on building. I got a great book that I read 20 years ago on Nehemiah. But can I say... Nehemiah had never got the wall built had he not sat down and wept. Mm. Not God is nigh them of a broken heart and saveth such of a contrite spirit. Say, so, preacher, we need a building. Good. Get on your face and start weeping for your loved ones. Start weeping for other people in this church's loved ones. Start getting a burden one for another. You know, the Bible said, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You know what that means? Uh, 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 not only weep for yourself, not only weep for your children, your grandchildren, your family members. Start weeping for everybody else's family members. And we start getting a burden one for another and one for another's family members and then start getting a burden for the community. You watch and see how quick God puts up a building. We find he halted, sat down, and he wept. And then notice he mourned certain days. This is one of the few messages I preached, I've ever preached without having it alliterated because the Bible does a great job itself. It said he wept and then he mourned certain days. He mourned for what had happened to Israel. Can I say it's easy to pop off on how bad America's got? Let me say I'm quick to do it. But I do love America. I remember when America was a whole lot different. And I sure do miss those days. My mind's going back to when we celebrated 1976, the bicentennial. It seemed like every Main Street was lined with patriotism. 
Seemed like every city had a parade. Uh, seemed like we celebrated uh, our heritage and what America was. Uh, now we have Pride Month. Mm. Now we celebrate wickedness in America. Mm. Uh, now we celebrate Target and Bud Light and all that garbage and all that they stand for. Whatever happened to patriotism? I was at a ball game the other day, and, and, and I didn't want to be in jail for the day services. They played the national anthem. I looked, and there was men with their hats on. The other day and day, somebody smack you if you wore a ball cap when Old Glory was waving and the Star Spangled Banner was being played. There was a day when it meant something to be an American. I remember when you put your hand over your heart and you said the pledge of allegiance to the flag, one nation under God, indivisible. I remember when there was a day when people took pride in being a Christian, when people took pride in going to church, when people took pride in the things of God. Can I say we can sit here and pine about it until we start mourning about it being grievous towards God, we'll not see revival. We'll not see anything happen. Listen, you can tell a drunk that he's a drunk, that ain't going to change him. You can tell a dope addict he's a dope addict, that's not going to change him. Guess what? A drunk knows he's drunk. A dope addict knows he's a dope addict. Hmm? You can tell a homosexual they're homosexual, or you can call them any slur you want, that's not going to offend them. You know what's going to change people? You getting a burden for them, get broken hearted for them, and telling them the gospel and telling them about the love of God. Yeah. That's the only thing that's going to change them. Uh, listen, don't you think a drunk would quit drinking if he could? Don't you think a dope addict would quit you know, doing drugs if they could? They've tried a thousand times. The only one who can break the chains is Jesus. Amen. But us calling them names isn't going to change it. The only thing that's going to change it's the love of God. Amen. Until we learn to mourn and grieve for people's souls and grieve for what's happened to our country, nothing's going to change. Huh? It's, we live in a day and age where everybody wants to point the finger at everybody else except themselves. Amen. And Christians and fundamental Baptists are the worst. Hmm? You know why America's in the shape she's in? Because we quit praying. Because we quit seeking God. Because we quit uh, hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Amen. We got to pumping out our chest that we're something special. Forgot what garbage got and dump God found us in. Started pointing our fingers at one another. Right. Instead of uh, 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 looking to heaven and crying for the mercies of God. Can I say? Until we learn to mourn certain days. That means he was in great sadness. He was in anguish over the news what had happened in Jerusalem. The city was burned with fire. The gates were broken down. The people were in much affliction. It broke his heart. Uh, and I say, let's not let America get any worse. Let's get broken hearted for America and more Personally, let's get broken hearted for Florence. There are people moving in here in droves. Hmm? Now, I've told you all before, I'm an only child, and I grew up with a great imagination because, you know, I didn't have anybody else to play with. It was just me. So I played Army, and I won every time. I'd sit up one on one side, and, one on, and I always won. Played checkers against myself. I always won. Huh? No matter what, I always won, you know? I didn't play well with others when others came into the picture. When my cousins came in, they didn't like me too much. Ask my Aunt Lynn back there, because guess who always had to win? Because that's what I was accustomed to. 
Well, that left me with a very vivid imagination. I know what the Bible says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Uh, 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 and I know some of you getting your sights on a building. I got news for you. Uh, I'm long past the building. I'm seeing on beyond that. Uh, uh, do you realize how many people are moving in here from Africa? Africans coming here to work at Amazon. Uh, and my mind is most of them are Muslim. Who's going to win them to God? Uh, we need an African ministry. Uh, we need a Spanish ministry. Uh, we need to reach people uh, with the gospel that we don't have the equipment for right now. So I'm praying for I'm praying for African speaking fellows. And I'm praying for uh, God to send a Spanish speaking fellows. Uh, and I'm praying that God uh, uh, will do far more than just build a building, friend. I'm wanting to see folks' lives changed. But see, that comes with great responsibility we got to mourn over what America is. Because when you start mourning over what she is, you'll get a burden for her. Until then, all you see is a bunch of Africans, a bunch of Mexicans. You see people moving in, seeing the roads getting bigger, the potholes getting bigger, more roundabouts going in, and all that leads you to do is complain. But you get alone and get the heart of God, you don't see the problems, you see the opportunities. Telling you, he mourned certain days. And then he did something that Baptists don't think is in the Bible. He said he fasted. Now, there have been some times I've called for a fast, and it's been too long. But, neighbor, when we start weeping and we start mourning for people to get right with God, we start really getting a burden. I'm going to call for a fast. And we'll fast. I mean, there's just something about when you get so enthralled in the things of God, not that you choose not to eat, but that you don't take time to eat. That gets God's attention. And the fasting's between us and God. It's not about us telling each other what we're giving up. It's about you spending special quality time with God. And I'll call for a fast to get to that point. And then he prayed. And he prayed. And he prayed. And can I say, when you get broken hearted, you get to the point you weep and you mourn and you fast, then your prayers are quickly answered. Hmm. It wasn't very long after this, Nehemiah is in Jerusalem building a wall. So tonight, the first step in the next step is we need to get broken before God. All it took was some news. Here's the news. This community is going to hell without Christ. There's a lot of construction going on, but there isn't any building. I'm talking about building for the kingdom. And the only thing that's going to impact people from dying and going to hell is folks who get a burden for them, and that will shine as lights. Now, we can offer up all kinds of excuses why we can't. We can never win that many people. You know, I've read the book, it's not up to us to to win them, it's up to us to tell them and live a life before them. The only one who can save them is God. And he's looking for a man to stand in the gap and make up the hedge. I wonder, are you willing to get a burden? Just get a burden for somebody. You know somebody needs God? You willing to start calling their name before God? You willing to start seeking God's face? You willing to weep over them? I found this. That once I get a burden for somebody, and evidently, Brother Josh, the Lord shows me 
somebody else and somebody else and somebody else because our problem brother Tony is we we have this innate ability as human beings to look at ourselves but when you start getting a burden for somebody else then all of a sudden you'll start seeing others and others and others before long it gets so burdensome you don't know how you can take another step it becomes grievous my dear friends when we get to that point start fasting and praying you watch and see God go to work it's not about a building it's about souls being saved when you get to the point you can't go to the gas station without seeing people dying and going to hell you get to the point you can't go to a shopping center or a grocery store without seeing people dying and going to hell you're, you're heading in the right direction It'll become so grievous you can't help but weep over folks. God help us to see the need. Listen. There's so many people out there just waiting for somebody to tell them. So many people out there waiting for somebody to show them. So many people wondering, is Jesus real? They've heard all the excuses from so-called believers, and they've heard that all the people who go to church are hypocrites. And they've heard, why don't we show them something different? It's one thing if I go up to somebody and say, you need Jesus. It's another thing if I go and there's tears coming down my eyes and say, I've been praying for you because you need Jesus. They need to know we care. And when God sees that we care, there's no limit to what God will do. Friends, we don't need this building if we don't get a burden for sinners to be saved. The first step, really the only step, is to get in a burden. One writer said the greatest burden is having no burden. When was the last time you had a burden? It amazes me how much people complain. It amazes me how much people look at others and find fault. But let me ask you, when was the last time you had a burden for a sinner? That's how we ought to measure our status in Christianity. What kind of Christian am I? The greatest Christians that ever have walked are men that had a burden for others. The great Apostle Paul would that himself would be a curse, that he would die and go to hell, that Israel might be saved. I wonder, are you willing to ask God for a burden? Why ask me to pray for your loved ones if you don't pray for them? Are you willing to start weeping over your loved ones? Then start weeping over other people's loved ones. Start weeping over sinners. You know, Nehemiah didn't weep over just a few. He wept over the whole nation. Amen. Are you willing to weep over somebody? <coughs> We're ever going to progress and go forward. We've got to get on our knees. And ask God to break our hearts. You know how to get a broken heart from God? Look at people the way He does. He died for sinners because He loved them so much. God help us. God help us get a burden for sinners. So tonight, I charge the Emmanuel Baptist Church to start praying for sinners. Start asking God, God, give me a burden for sinners. Quit looking around 
at other people and look to God and say, God, break my heart. God, show me if there's any wicked way in me and break my heart for sinners. God, I want to see sinners saved. Will you do that tonight? Will you start praying for sinners? And I'm not talking about these little now I lay me down. I'm talking about praying for sinners. Will you take time every day and pray for some specific sinner? Pray for somebody you know is lost. And let that impact your, your, your walk and your life. And start praying for more specific sinners because God answers specific prayers. You know what might just happen? You might get such a burden for them, you invite them to church and bring them to church with you. You might watch them walk an aisle and trust Christ. And they might win ten sinners to Christ. But it all starts with a burden. Are you willing to pray for sinners? Friends, without a burden, there's no need for ministry. God break our hearts for sinners. Some have already come. Let's stand. Miss Renee, if you'd just come play something softly on the piano. Will you come and ask God for a burden? Ask God to put somebody specifically on your heart. If you got a child or grandchild or brother or sister or cousin or nephew or neighbor, somebody that's not saved, Somebody's out of the will of God. Will you come and ask God to work in their heart? Folks are coming. She'll begin playing. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. God, break our hearts. We don't need to look to the future for a need. There's needs all around us, Lord. Folks lost without God. The walls of America has been broken down. The streets are burned. God, our people are in anguish. They're Christian suffering. But more importantly, they're lost people on their way to hell who will suffer for all of eternity. God, break our hearts for sinners. And give us the mind and heart of Christ. And God, help us not to rest without praying and weeping over sinners. God, enlarge our heart for those destitute without God. God, in hell enlarges herself every day. Help us to charge the gates of hell. God, help us, Lord, become broken before you. God, do a work in us and use us so you can do a work in others. Now, bless our folks. Lord, some of the greatest people living for God I know of is in this building. God, give us a greater burden for sinners. Lord, we don't need a building without a burden. God, help us get our eyes off of others or off ourselves and try and judge people. God, just break our hearts to be a light, to be salt. God, do work. Bless these that are in the altar. Have your way, Father. We'll thank you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.